Christo Tito Asi. Okay. If not, we'll, we'll get started. <coughs> okay, so um, our last class, we had a quick introduction to uh, governmental accounting. We talked about the different bases of accounting. We talked about the measurement focus, right? We talked about the objectives of government financial reporting for different uh, uh, types of organization. Today we'll begin to really get into the heart of accounting for governmental uh, entities. And in chapter three and four, that's what's going to be. There are going to be a lot of journal entries and we're going to go through them, some of them very quickly, and some of them I'll take some time to explain to you. But basically what we'll do first is take a look at the statement of activities. Statement of activities is like your income statement. Statement of activities is for, it's prepared on a um, full accrual basis, and um, that's why we see the word expenses and revenues. We'll take a look at that. And uh, we'll take a look at the governmental funds, the revenues and expenditures, see how we have one statement, statement of activity prepared on an accrual basis, the other, the statement of revenue and expenditures, which is the second statement, so you can make a comparison between the two. And we'll take a look at how these items are actually classified. And we'll then take a look at the um, how we account or specifically the journal entries for some of these areas. Now, the way to learn this is you have to make sense out of what you see. You cannot memorize this. It's not going to work. So you have to kind of understand how we do this. This is not rocket science. This is just, it's very straightforward, but you just need to understand the terminology, okay? And I'll try to keep it simple that way. And we'll then take a look at, uh, actually we won't spend a lot of time uh, in governmental accounting information systems and we won't actually cover at all that last topic, which is revenue and expenses of public school system. We will not cover that area, okay? So if you are interested, you can read that on your own in the back. If I were teaching this class for our governmental accounting program, I'll be covering that, but not for this class, okay? So let's take a look at the government-wide statement of activities, okay? Now, before we do that, let's just take a look at the uh, statement itself. This is what it looks like. This is the statement of activity, okay, right from the book. I want you to just take a minute and look at this statement. Just, okay. What's the format? Expenses minus revenues equal what? Net revenues or expense, right? Interesting format. It's flipped around, right? Okay. Then what do you see? On the left-hand side, you see a list of functions. What are some of those functions? I talked to you about general government, right? Safety, public safety, recreation. All These are all the functions, things that governments do, right? What's that interest on long-term debt? It's separated, not allocated, but separated. The top part, this part, these are your direct expenses and these are your indirect expenses, okay? So just understand that. Now, look at the program revenues. Look at the three categories. Charges for services, that's one, what you charge. So if you operated a swimming pool, you might charge people for using the swimming pool. It's under park and recreation. Operating grants, you might receive grants from other, other governments to do something. And capital grants, difference between one is used to purchase equipment and assets, the other is used for what? To cover your operating expenses. That's the difference. Got the top part? Okay, now let's take a look at the bottom part. Notice the net expense revenue is what a negative number, right? 
it will always be a negative number. Now what do we have at the bottom? General revenues. What types of things do you see? Taxes. They are general revenue. They don't belong to any one function. They are for all the functions. So general revenues are what? They cover all the revenues which cover all the functions. Then you have special item and extraordinary item. Just hold on to that for a moment. I'll talk to you about that a little bit later. And basically, by adding the net expense number to the total general revenue, you come up with something called a change in net position. Plus, the net position at the beginning gives you the net position at the end. So this is what I like you. This is the format I'd like you to keep in mind. And most of you probably saw this as you were doing the CAFR exercise. Um, let's go back to, so everybody got this? This is what I just talked to you about, right? Difference between uh, direct expenses and indirect expense, right? What's an example of indirect expense? Great. Depreciation expense, it could be both direct and indirect. Mostly it's direct, but it could be indirect too. Everybody should know the difference between program revenues and general revenues, right? One is for a specific program, the other is what? For all the activities. So you should understand the difference between the two. Program revenues are into three th these three different categories, which we just looked at, and understand the format. Got that? Right? We just looked at that. General revenues are always reported in the lower section of the statement. If I ask you a question about taxes, taxes are always what? General revenue, right? Um, actually, let's do one thing. Let's take a look at a question in the book. See if you... Okay, I'm going to... Um, See this question three, four? I want you to take a look at it and tell me if it's program revenues or general revenues. Okay, we'll start off. The first question, unrestricted operating grants that can be used at the discretion of the city council, not for any function, but for anything. What would it be? Excellent. Uh, next one, capital grants for highway construction. Excellent. Next one, charges for building inspection. Program for building inspections, right? Good. Uh, special assessment for snow removal. Excellent. Uh, fines and forfeits. Well, actually, you know what? The answer that you gave me is the answer which most people who do not know this would answer. But GASB has decided to put fines and forfeits, believe it or not, as charges for services. Very strange, but it's an exception, okay? I'm not surprised listening to that answer because a lot of people are confused. You read that in the book, by the way. It's uh, program revenues. How about motor vehicle fuel taxes? Now, this is the key. Anytime you hear the word taxes, always general revenue. It doesn't matter what it says, general revenue. If it's taxes of any kind, it's general revenue. How about unrestricted investment earnings? General, because it's what? Unrestricted to for anything. Did you have a question in the back there? 
Yes, because w there is a rule, there, there is a, we've all agreed in government that any kind of taxes will always be classified as general taxes, even if it's for a specific purpose. If they are taxes, they are general revenue. All right, so you did pretty good well in this case. Uh, let's keep on going. Um, let's take a look at the uh, definition of two other items. <coughs> These are two items. And you probably saw this extraordinary item, and I'd like you to understand the definition of these two. I will ask you this question in the exam difference between extraordinary and special item, okay? And if I forget, remind me in the exam that I told you that I was gonna ask you, okay? All right, but um, this is, the reason is that if you recall in the statement of activities, at the bottom, we saw these two items. So let me give you an example. There was a government in Florida there's a local government in Florida, and there's a hurricane. Comes and does a lot of damage to government buildings. It's not an art. So the question is, is it an extraordinary event or not an extraordinary event? Or is it a special item? So let's take a look at extraordinary items. By the way, extraordinary items are mostly costs that government incur, something that happens which is not normal, okay? Both unusual in nature and infrequent in occurrence. Are hurricanes in Florida unusual in nature and infrequent? Okay, now let's turn around and come to New Jersey. Hurricane Sandy, how would you classify that? Is it extraordinary or not extraordinary? How many people say extraordinary? majority of it, and how many people say otherwise, ordinary, because if it's not extraordinary, it's what, ordinary. It's actually extraordinary because what, it's not, even though it could happen, but it doesn't meet that definition. It has to be unusual in nature and infrequent in occurrence <coughs> beyond the control of management, right? Let's take a look at special items. These are either unusual or infrequent, but are within the control of management. What could be an item like that? Well, we looked at the cost side. Let's take a look at the revenue side. And this is an interesting story. About 10 years ago, we had a governor in New Jersey, actually a treasurer in New Jersey, who decided the state was running short on money. So they decided, how do we balance our budget? You know, there's a stretch of 95 from where the New Jersey Turnpike finishes to George Washington Bridge. There's a section of 95. And uh, they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to, the state of New Jersey is going to sell that stretch of 95 to the New Jersey Turnpike so that they could put a, you know, they decided to, they could put a tip. Why did they want to do that? so that they could get revenue from where? From the New Jersey Turnpike so that they could then balance the budget. Now, how do you show the revenue that comes in to the state for a transaction like that? First of all, is it unusual and infrequent? You don't sell toll roads every, I mean, you don't sell roads every day, so it's unusual, but it is within the control of management, right? Management had control over that sale. So it's kind of a, Interesting example, but an example right from New Jersey. So you will find examples of this and you must know how, the, um, how to distinguish them. Okay. So what's, the heart, what's at the heart of government operation? It's called what? The general fund. If you have a government, you always have what? A general fund. No matter how small, you always have a general fund. Some folks call it current fund. 
the operating fund, uh, different terms to, uh, you know, uh, to describe it. And these are the functions. These are the traditional services that are performed. Nothing different, not, nothing complicated. This is what they do. So from now on, when you look at your town, think about these are the things that your town does for you. Public safety, public works, cultural recreation, health and welfare. Now, um, what distinguishes governmental accounting from all other types of accounting is this thing called budgetary accounting. So put yourself in the shoes of a chief financial officer for a town or a city. Before you can spend a single dollar on anything, you must be authorized to do that. How do you get that authorization? By having a budget that's passed. Once that budget is passed, you now have the authority to spend those monies. Well, what happens is when the budget is passed, something happens on the accounting end, which is these budgetary accounts get set up. So if you expected a million dollars of revenue, you create a budgeted, a budgetary account called estimated revenues of a million. If you're going to spend a million dollars during the year, you create an um, account. We don't call it estimated expenditure. We call it appropriation. Okay? Estimated revenues and what? Appropriation. That's our plan, what we're going to get and what we're going to spend. Should it always be exactly equal? Okay, now put yourself in the CFO's shoes. If you are getting revenues of a million, do you put in a million dollars worth of appropriations? What would you do? Would you make it more or less? More. Would you want to spend more? No. You would want estimated revenues to be more just in case you didn't get all those revenues, right? So most governments, what they do is when they budget, they budget in a way where they say, okay, I'm going to get a million, but boy, if my estimates are wrong, I better not spend the entire million. Let me just budget 950 or 980. That difference between the two is money going into an account called fund balance. Fund balance is like your owner's equity. Fund balance is like your owner's equity. That's what's left over. And you know, people, these governments have a little kitty bank where they, they put these monies in. So when there is a problem and they don't have enough money, they take the money out of the fund balance. And that's what, we'll take a look at this, okay? And this is the account which is called estimated revenue, appropriations. These are budgetary accounts. They don't exist under accrual basis of accounting. They only exist in a budgetary system. There is a distinction between estimated revenue and other financing sources. It's not complicated, but you need to understand this. Estimated revenues are things like taxes, right? Let me give you an example of estimated other financing sources. You go out and borrow money. Money comes in as cash, is that revenue when you borrow money? No. It's called by another name, and that's called other financing sources. So something which is not truly revenue, but it's coming to you, is thrown into this category called other financing sources. Remember, right now, the cap we are wearing says modified accrual basis. Just as with appropriations, if you get confused with the word appropriation, think in your head, estimated expenditures. We don't call it that, but if that's what it is. The word is appropriation. Estimated other financing uses. What could it be? Something which is not expenditures. 
It's like a transfer from one fund to another. You're sending money to another fund. That would be your other financing use, okay? And I'll explain this to you shortly, encumbrance and encumbrance outstanding. So what are the six budgetary accounts? These are the accounts. Now we're going to go into this a little bit, but you must understand the equation, the accounting equation. Assets equal what? Liabilities plus fund balance. What is fund balance? Owner's equity, but we don't call it owner's equity. What do we call it? We call it fund balance, right? And within fund balance, we'll talk about there are all these different categories. Fund balance that you can spend and fund balance that you can cannot spend. And you wonder, how could it be? You got money in the bank. Why is it that you couldn't spend it? Well, if it's ba fund balance which is tied in inventory, you can't spend inventory. So that would be an example. But this is a simple way. So these are your balance sheet accounts and then your operating statement accounts and your budgetary accounts. See that? We have three levels of accounts. Balance sheet, operating, and budgetary. So far, we were only used to two, balance sheet and operating. Now there's a third layer, budgetary. And that's the reason why commercial accounting packages don't work in government. You can't go buy QuickBooks. You can't go buy a, a software, the most sophisticated software which is used in a commercial enterprise and say, oh, I'll use this in government. Why? Oops, sorry. I should have checked my phone. Okay. You cannot do that because what you have is um, um, you don't have support of budgetary accounting and you don't have support for encumbrance. Okay. And I spoke to you that the difference between, understand the difference between uh, operating uh, between revenues and other financing sources and expenditures and other financing sources. Okay. And again, uh, <coughs> what do revenues do? They increase fund balance, right? And what do expenditures do? They decrease fund balance. If you have trouble with this, make it even more simple for yourself. Think of this as cash, all cash. What happens when you get money in? It increases your bank account, which is what? Your fund balance. If that's what makes it easier, it's not technically that way, but if that's what makes it easier, that's what you use because you use the modified accrual basis of accounting. Um, So let's take a look at look at the format. This is remember I showed you the statement of activities. Now that was prepared on an accrual basis. This is a statement which is prepared on the modified accrual basis. And it looks totally different from that statement. This is so statement of, and you cannot forget this, statement of activity is what? On an accrual basis, statement of revenue expenditures and changes in fund balance, a long name, is under modified accrual basis. Two identical statements with two different bases of accounting which look different. You have revenues, right? Notice here, they are divided into different categories, but it looks very different from the other one. Okay. And look at this statement. So you have revenue and expenditures, and there's that other financing sources and use. I'd like you to see what you see within that category.
okay? So everybody see the examples of other financing source and use? This is the format for the operating statement prepared on a modified accrual basis. Two statements, statement of activities and statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. And uh, look at the, again, the budgetary and revenue accounts. You should take a good look at this. This is what we talked about. And then before I explain the next topic, I'd like you to take a look at this statement. Don't, don't be, con uh, be concerned about the specifics. Look at the heading, original, final, actual, encumbrance, budget, and variance. What does that all mean? What's the original mean in this statement? Original budget that was passed January 1, whatever. What does final mean? Okay, so you had the original budget. And something happened during the year, like lots of snow. And your snow blowing budget blew off. What do you do? You revise your budget for that line item, right? So your final budget could be different than your original budget, but it has to be balanced, right, still. So you could add revenues or subtract, and same thing you can add to that, what, that final number. What is actual? What you actually spent, right? Hold on to the encumbrance, we'll talk about that. And you now have the budgetary actual, and what is that variance column with final budget, positive, negative? What does that mean? It's the difference between the what? It's between, take a look at it, tell me what do you think it is. Is it between the original and actual or final and actual? Final and actual. This was your variance. And this is what people do. If you're the CFO, you would look at this statement every three months and you'd say, how am I doing here? So in this case, how did they do with property taxes, good or bad? Did they do good or bad with property taxes? They did well, right? Because their actual was what? More than their final number, right? Go down to the expenditures now, okay? How did they do with central operations, if you can read that? They did well too, right? They spent less than what they should have spent, right? Okay. By the way, if you're very curious about what the encumbrance is, encumbrance is an item which has been ordered but not yet received. So we actually take that into account. Again, I'll go into this, but for the time being, just remember that. It's a commitment you have made. You haven't gotten the service yet, but it's a commitment. You better count that into your, into your numbers, okay? All right. Um, let's go back and uh, We talked about, okay, we just talked about this. And this is what we are doing, actually. Comparing actual revenues to estimated revenues to come up with how we, you know, how, how things are going. Now, these control accounts for this class, don't be concerned about it. Because you know what this is? Everybody know the use of control accounts? So if you have an AR control, what does it mean? If you have a subsidiary ledger for accounts receivable, if you had 10 customers, right? Each customer listed separately in the accounts receivable ledger, the control account would be what? The total of those 10 customers. That's what this is. It's the same thing in governments. We do that, but don't be concerned about that. It's really not, um, not an important area. It's more for practitioners. Now let's take a look at um, 
classification of revenues and estimated revenues. Okay. Take a look at this list for a moment. And we'll talk about these. Which is the biggest single source of revenues for governments? Good. Anybody know what ad valorem means? It's based on value. More money you make, the more taxes you pay. The more your house is worth, the more real estate taxes you pay, right? Special assessments, we'll hold off on that for a moment. We'll talk about that. Licenses and permits, what is that? You have a dog you need to do get what? At home, a dog license, right? You have to register and pay a small fee, right? Intergovernmental revenues, what are they? Revenues coming from one part of the government to another, from the federal to the state government. Hurricane Sandy, federal government sends all this money to New Jersey towns, that's intergovernmental revenues. Charges for services. You go out, do something, you have to pay for it. You are building an addition to your house. You apply for a construction permit. You fill out an application and pay for that. That's charges for service. Fines and forfeits, we don't want to be in that category, right? That's usually means trouble, right? And miscellaneous revenues. Now, why are these listed? Because most of us know what they are. The important thing is how do we recognize each one of these in our books? Do you recognize them when you receive them? Do you recognize them when you levy them? When do you recognize these revenues? And that's why we have this listed here. So it, the question is the rules of recognition. Let's take a the look at the biggest one of them. <coughs> Property taxes. And uh, OK, how many? How many of you understand how property taxes work in New Jersey? Okay, you should, because when you go out and buy a home, it's going to be important for you to understand how this works. You own a home, and when you buy the house, it tells you what the property tax is on that house. Let's assume you have a home, and usually it's expressed as a percentage value of the house. In New Jersey, it's different terminology. They'd say, you know, $2 per 100. What does that mean? 2%, right? Or $20 per 1,000. What does that mean? Still 2%, right? So instead of just saying 2%, they don't they say $20 or $2, whatever, whatever it might be, but it's usually as a percentage of the, of the value, right? Now, the way things work here is that, um, thank God we don't have personal property tax, unlike some of the states, where if you owned a car, you'd have to pay tax on that car, the value of the car, okay? But um, in New Jersey's case, property taxes are collected for two different purposes. And this is not part of the accounting part, but this is more for you to understand. They are collected for running the municipality where you are the resident. They are collected for the schools in your town. And they are collected for county government, the county that you're in. So if you pay taxes in West Orange, it would be West Orange Municipal Government, West Orange School District, and County of Essex. Three different bills all coordinated into one number. And it's not cheap, Essex County. It's not unusual to find an average home in West Orange or South Orange paying $20,000 in taxes a year. Okay. So if you were going out looking for a home, what do two things people look at? Look at the tax rate and look at the school district, the quality of the school. 
That's why people shop there. When they go out, they don't look for the price. They look at those two factors first, especially if they're raising a young family. So it's the school district and the taxes that they need to pay because taxes can take a very big bite in New Jersey. Um, again, not part of this, but I wanted to explain that to you. Okay, so let's go back to this in a moment. Um, actually, we'll talk about it now. The way things work with town is if you were the chief financial officer for a town, so the folks come in and they say, you know what, we're going to be spending a million dollars during the year to provide services, cops and parks and recreation, all these things. You scratch your head and say, all right, we gotta figure out how we're gonna get these million, this million dollars. So you say, all right, what's your estimate for charges for services? 10,000, oh, that's not, doesn't do too much for us. How much uh, revenue can we get from grants? Oh, I think this year we can get $50,000. All right, oh, that's another one. How much can we get for, you know, and we make up this list. <coughs> and let's assume, lefty, let's assume that you come up with $300,000 worth of revenue. Still doesn't hit a million. That's what that word is. See the word residual? Whatever's left is goes into property taxes. So if you could raise 300,000, how much would you have to raise from property tax owners? Property owners, 700,000. That's why it's called residual source of. Okay. Now I'm going to give you, a, let's take it to the next step. So you're the CFO doing all these calculations. Instead of 700, let's assume that the gap you came up with was $960,000. $960,000 and you say, all right, that's the amount we, I need to get from property taxes. Now you go to the tax collector, who collects the taxes, and say last year, when you went out to collect the taxes, what was your uncollectible portion? Says to you, well, you know, 4% was uncollectible. I got 96%, it's like that debt. Provision for doubt for the town. <coughs> so you say, all right, 96%. You collected only 96%. Hmm. So if I have $960,000 I need, how much do I need to raise to get 960? 960,000 divided by 0.96 gives me what? A million dollars that now I need to raise so that I can get what? 960,000. That's the concept of gross tax levy. So the gross tax levy is the gross amount that you need to raise so you'd have enough money that you projected as being needed for your budget. Okay. So Make a note of that. Know how to calculate the gross tax levy. And I'll go through these quickly. You can read about this. I, you know, uh, it doesn't happen too much here in New Jersey. Special assessment taxes against property owners that receive a particular benefit that's not received by all of them. So let's say there were five homes and in front of each one of them, the sidewalk was totally shot. And the town says, you know, you gotta fix this. And they say, look, this is gonna cost us a lot of money. I don't have $5,000 to spend on fixing all this. So the town says, all right, we'll fix it for you and we'll bill you $1,000 every year for doing this. Special assessment, I made it very simple. We'll talk about it more. Where they benefit only certain property owners, not everybody, just a few property owners. Licenses and permits, I talked about liquor licenses. Take a guess, what does an average liquor license cost? <laughs> Actually, he's right, he's absolutely right. A million dollars. 
where did you, where was this an example of from? Hold on, yeah? That's right. That's right. And he's absolutely right. The right to sell liquor in your restaurant, you might have to pay what? A million dollars. <laughs> and intergovernmental, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we, uh, because this is one of the, uh, I think one of the assignments that I've also given you. But um, let me see if it talks a little bit more about this. If not, we'll talk about it now. But basically, uh, let me explain this to you. Grants are very big in government. Government receives a lot of grants from federal government, state government, and it's a major source of funding, okay? The question is, how do you recognize grants? You say, it's very simple. When I get them, I show it as revenue. It doesn't work that way. Let me give you two examples. You're given some money to run some kind of a program for the youth. Not this year, next year. But you get the money today from the federal government. When do you show that as revenue? Now or next year? Next year, right? Why? Because it's intended for what? Next year. But you got the cash. So tell me, what would the journal entry be? You debit cash and what would you credit? You can't credit revenue. What would you credit? Deferred or unearned revenue, right? It's deferred revenue, right? By the way, that's the, that's the assignment question for this week, okay? Exactly that, okay? So you have that. Now let me give you another example. Same example. I give you a, the federal government sends you a check for $100,000 that says you can spend it for anything, but you need to spend it for something next year, not this year. What would you do? Would you, it's, there's time restriction, not purpose restriction, but time restriction. What would you do? Same exact thing. You would book the revenue when you can use it, right? If you understand that, you've gotten the grant, how to work, okay? So the question you always ask when you get a grant is, when can I use it? Time restriction, how can I use it? Purpose restriction. By the way, most of the time, federal government doesn't just send you a check. They want you to spend it first before you get the money from them in real world. And by the way, that's the word, the fancy word, eligibility requirements have been met. Their time or purpose. Okay, we talked about charges for services. I don't think you need to be, when you perform the service, that's when you recognize the revenue. Why are we going through all of this? Just to figure out how to book the revenue. Fines and forfeits. Again, this is the rule. We won't spend much time on it because it's not <coughs> material, okay? Miscellaneous revenues. Now, you're the CFO of a government, you're sitting down, your year end, December 31st, October, November, you realize you're in trouble. There is not enough money coming in. And you know, so you say, why couldn't you just close the year with a deficit? In New Jersey and many states, you cannot have a deficit at the end of the year. You're not permitted to have a deficit, a budget which anticipates a deficit. Guess who's the only government which is allowed to have a deficit as part <coughs> of its budget? That's right, because they can print money. State governments and local entities cannot pass a budget which has a deficit built in. So now you're in October, November. You're a city in California in real trouble. You say, geez, what am I gonna do? 
And this is when the tricks, the gimmicks begin to occur. They begin to sell their assets. It shows up as miscellaneous revenues or special items. They push back their expenditures to the next year. So if the people are getting paid on December 31st, they move it to January 3rd, okay, to miss that payroll. And it happens in government all the time, unfortunately. Okay. But I wanted to explain that to you because even though these could be immaterial, sometimes they could be quite important. Again, look at the definition of these two items. Okay. Don't forget the definition of appropriations. Legal authorization to spend money. You cannot spend money in government without having a legal authorization to spend. Encumbrance is the estimated amount recorded for purchase orders, contracts, or others. Let me just explain this to you. So you're again the CFO. You've got a $10,000 budget for office supplies. You spend 9000 already. It's December 1. You've got one more month to go. Person goes out. One part of the office goes out and orders some item. Another part goes out and orders some more item. You haven't received them, because when you receive them, that's when you get the bill. What would happen if there was no place to really control the amount of purchase orders that were being sent out? You'll overspend the item. So what is the rule, and this is what makes governmental accounting different from all other accounting is whenever you purchase an item, you have to go through the encumbrance system, which is what? It basically says, when I cut the purchase order, before I can send it, it gets recorded as an encumbrance, as a commitment against the free balance I have. If I have $1,000 and I cut a purchase order for $200, how much do I have available to spend now? Only 800 even though I haven't received the item, what is it done? It's encumbered, and that's the word encumbrance. It's a budgetary entry, okay? And basically it says <coughs> to prevent overspending, as it says here. So at the end of the year, when I look at my picture, on what I have spent. Do I just look at the expenditures only? No, I look at the expenditures plus what I have committed, which are my encumbrances, because those are purchase orders that I've sent out. Again, they have control accounts. Uh, you can read about it just like with the others. We have control accounts and subsidiary ledger. Don't be concerned about that here. Okay, so we looked at you've been hired by a governmental entity as an accountant. This entity has very poor records, doesn't really, you have to set up the accounting system. What's one of the first things that you do when you set up an accounting system? Well, the budget is set up, but what would you do if you had this computer and you were to set up? You set up a chart of accounts, right? Which, where, what do you do? You have accounts with account numbers, right? Right? And what we have is the chart of accounts in governments are very complicated. You have the fund. How many different types of funds did we? We had all kinds, right? From general funds, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital projects fund, permanent fund, right? Enterprise fund, internal service fund, those are our funds, right? Function or programs, we talked about that. Police, fire, general government, right? Organizational units, units that fulfill that function. So you could have public safety being run through two, two different departments. That would be your organizational activity. 
Actually, let's see if there's more here so I can, here we go. Yeah, explains it right here. Funds, I just spoke to you, function or program, organizational unit. And basically what it is is a, upside down tree. So basically you are starting with the highest, the level of hierarchy and then what is it? It's going down below, just like a root. You know, a tree with its uh, roots coming down because what you have is the fund is the highest and then we come to the function or program, the organizational unit, and then we have the activity which could be, you know, garbage removal and things like that. Character, which could be the um, type of expense, debt service as opposed to capital and object. I'm not going to go through this too much because you can read about this and it's really not that difficult to comprehend. I want to address more of the important areas. Okay, so there's one journal entry I want you to know, and that's this. For the time being, see the bottom part of this? Pretend it doesn't exist for the bottom, just the, those first three lines. I want you to read this and tell me um, just for a moment and think about this. This is the journal entry which is made by every single government every year when the budget is passed. Estimated revenues is debited. Appropriation, which is estimated expenditure, is accredited, and budgetary fund balance. And what confuses students is, they say revenues. Geez, I thought revenues always had a credit balance. Estimated. Budgetary accounts always have the opposite balance of the real account. So expenditures have what? Expenses, I could spend, have what? A balance of what? A debit. So what would estimated expenditures or appropriations have a balance of? Credit. Revenues have a balance of what? Credit balance, but estimated revenues are what? Debit. And you might wonder why is this the case? And let me see if there is a illustration to show you actually maybe in the next chapter. Um, but basically what happens is, in your mind, I want you to think of a, a T account or just an account, a revenue account. If I needed to raise a million dollars, my first entry would be what? Debit, revenues, one million, right? Or as in this case, 500,000, right? I receive $10,000. What would my entry be? Debit, cash, credit, revenue. Now what's happened? That balance was what? 500,000, right? If I credit that $10,000 number, what's my balance now? It would be 490. What does that 490 mean to you? What does it mean to you? This is the amount that I still need to collect. That's the purpose behind this. So when you look at the ledger, you always know how much more money do you need to collect. Let's take the example again. You debit estimated revenues, so you now have a debit balance of 500,000. You receive $10,000, real money. Debit, cash, credit, revenue. So debit balance of 500 and credit of 10,000, what does it give me? Debit of 490, and that's the amount that I still need to collect. That's how budgetary accounting systems work. And the same thing happens with appropriation. Appropriation, you, when you has a credit balance of 450, when you buy something, for $10,000, it gets debited, and what do you have left to spend? 440, right? 
If you get that, you're in good shape. If you don't, you need to look at the example in the book. Actually, here's the example. Yeah? Yeah. It could be the initial budget, and it could be the initial, and final, you know, we could add to that. This is the example, by the way. Here I talked about it, but it's right here. Look at how it's shown. They received two flows of revenue, 4,000 and 5,000. Now what do we have? 41,000. This is a budgetary account. Rocket science? No. But very... Uh, it's purpose-driven because that's what the purpose here is, to show us where we stand. Okay, now the second journal entry. Oh, by the way, let me just go back to the first journal entry. <coughs> the CFO here, do you have a problem with him or her making this journal entry? Do you think he or she is being prudent? It looks like you're being very conservative by not spending all the money, right? But usually the answer is never that. You have to go behind the facts, as we'll look at shortly. What if I were to reverse this? Estimated revenues were 450, and appropriations were 500, and now the budgetary fund balance goes the other way. Would you be concerned? Yeah, you'd be. You'd want to know where's that? What's going on here? Right? But if I came back and said to you, you know what? We have like a million dollars sitting in this fund balance account. You thought we use it. If you're the property owner, you'd say, yes, please use that money instead of taking taxes from me. Right? So what we have is this con conflicting interest of stakeholders in government. Now let's go to the journal entry. This is the second journal entry that I want you to want always never forget, okay? It's the same journal entry every single time. When you order an item, you debit a budgetary account called encumbrance, and you credit a budgetary account called encumbrance outstanding. Now, this entry is so simple when you receive the item, so what was the cost of the item? 500, right? And the item came back and you received the item, you reverse the entry. You debit encumbrance outstanding and credit encumbrances. So you say, why do we do this? Again, as I said, we do this because what we want to do is as soon as we use the word encumbrance, we are reserving a certain amount in the account as commitment so that it cannot be overspent. And we'll take a look at that. Look at this for a moment. The second and the, the first and the third line. First and the third line. Everybody see that? Right? What did we do? We reversed it, right? How much they actually end up spending? You know, it would be nice if whatever we put at, in our purchase order was the final bill. Usually you get the final bill, they add uh, transportation. I was going to say taxes, but no, because governments don't pay taxes, right? So, yeah, actually, if you work for government and you get a bill from a vendor, and it has taxes, you are allowed legally to pull that item out of the bill. Okay. So here, they actually spending, ended up spending what? 515. But notice, we didn't make this 515 because this is the original amount. We need to keep it at that. Okay. Now, I want you to just for a moment look at this journal entry, I mean this ledger, and see if you understand it. Just take a moment.
Okay, so for this account, they had $1,500 that they could spend. Notice what happens as soon as they issue a purchase order and then they, they made the encumbrance entry. It goes down to what? $1,000, right? Notice the next entry. That encumbrance is reserved, is reversed, expenditure is shown, and what do we have left? 985. Does it make sense? See that? See what's done here? This is reversed. 515 is now taken out to give you, because 515 minus 500 minus this number gives you 985. This is an example of a ledger. So these are the two journal entries that I want you to really, from this chapter, that I'd like you to keep in mind. Allotments, read on your own. This is um, really, uh, you know, this comes for the, the following reason. If you have the entire year's budget, right, what if you blew the entire year's budget in the first three months? You still have money left each year until March you're done. So what allotments do is, if you had $1,000 for the budget, they say, you know what, the maximum you can spend is 250 every quarter. So that's what the allotment concept is. Computerized accounting systems. What I'll tell you this, and this is from my previous experience when I actually did this for a living, was um, um, from the practitioner side, would you believe that there are, there's no real good piece of computer software which actually does both accrual and modified accrual basis? We all have to take different things to get it done. So for instance, the software that I use was Oracle eBusiness Suite which does allow modified accrual basis to be used because it has budgetary accounting. But I could not produce government-wide statements for it. So this chapter talks about this. And when you go to chapter 9, it also talks about it. And this is what this slide really talks about. We won't talk about the accounting for public school districts. Um, and actually, that's chapter three. So what did we, um, so what did we study this, uh, in this chapter? We looked at uh, statement of activity, distinction between direct and indirect, right? We looked at extraordinary items. We looked at special items. We looked at what comprised general revenues. We looked at program revenues. <coughs> we looked at the different types of budgetary accounting. The different types of budgetary accounts, rather. Expenditures. Estimated revenues, appropriations, encumbrances. We looked at other financing sources and uses. We looked at the format of the statement itself. And we looked at some of the journal entries, more specifically, one to record the budget and the other to record an encumbrance. So any questions? That wasn't that difficult, right? OK. I know it's after lunch. I see some of you just kind of. Okay, so um, the next chapter. All right, guys, let's settle down so we can. Are we done? Everybody here? 
Everybody done? Okay. All right, let's get started. All right, guys, let's let's calm down. So this chapter really talks about, um, this is a journal ent uh, chapter filled with journal entries, just what you want to be doing. More journal entries than any other chapter that you'll find in the entire text. And basically what it will do is it will take you to an entire cycle from collecting revenues to spending money, what happens at the end, and there's a series of transactions that this chapter really goes over, and that's what we'll be doing uh, for the next hour or so. <laughs> now, what's going to be happening is that, uh, and I think I spoke about this before, you have to record transactions both under modified accrual basis and under accrual basis. How do you do that with one general ledger? It's very hard. So what the book uses is something called Joel Track, where you record transactions two different ways, as if you had two different accounting systems. In reality, it doesn't exist, but to make things easier for us to understand, we'll be looking at this Joel Track accounting. And there are some things about exchange and non-exchange transactions, but the basic gist of this is really understanding the journal entries. You should never forget this, the measurement focus of governmental funds, current financial resources, modified accrual basis, and never forget that capital assets and non-current liabilities are never recorded. Only at the government-wide level are they recorded. This is what I was talking to you about, the dual track, and we'll take a look at examples. I'll give you an example again from the last class. You record an encumbrance. What do you do? You debit encumbrance and credit encumbrance outstanding. That entry is made on the modified accrual basis. How about accrual basis? Nothing. Zilcho. Nothing. You record depreciation under accrual depreciation. Under accrual basis, you debit depreciation and credit accumulated depreciation. Under modified accrual basis, nothing, because in the modified accrual basis, we don't recognize depreciation. You make a payroll. Bless you. You have payroll. You debit payroll expense, credit cash, same under both modified and accrual basis. Three different transactions recorded three different ways. A transaction that can only affect governmental funds but not government-wide, transaction which only affects government-wide but not government funds, and a transaction which has affects both of them equally. So we'll be taking a look at, and that's what this dual track is. This is a journal entry, I think we, went through this before. Um, when you see a journal entry like this, does it cause uh, any concern to you? Is this an example of poor financial management? Well, Let's look at the answer. Generally, when you debit the fund balance at the start of the year, that means you're using your reserves, okay? 
And uh, unless you have a very good reason, you should your revenue should always exceed your appropriations. Revenues should always exceed appropriations. But if you have a lot of money sitting there in the bank, you might have to use that money. Because the taxpayers might say, wait a minute, you're sitting with a million dollars in the bank and you want to raise my taxes? Go get it from, the, from that bank account. That's when you have this journal entry. You're using 388000 from the bank because your estimated revenues are less than your appropriations. This is not a normal journal entry, but it can happen. The beauty of this journal entry is that at the end of the year, when you're ready to close the year, you reverse this entry, just like the encumbrance entry. So what would you do? Your debit appropriations, credit estimated revenues, and credit budgetary fund balance, you have to reverse it so you can close the budgetary accounts. All budgetary accounts have to be closed at the end of the year. You cannot leave them open. They have to be closed, except for encumbrances, which we'll talk about. And this is what that is, is, um, and I don't mean to really go into this too much, but you know, I think you should understand this because when you go out work, not that you'll be working in government, but if some of you might end up with that, is it's not it's not about governmental accounting, it's about government financial management. In fact, I run a certificate program in the program, the master's program, which is a certificate in government financial management, which is teaches you how to manage governmental finance, a mix of budgeting, finance, accounting, all together, auditing. And what this basically says is that we should always have money in fund balance, some reserve. Here, what is it? 10 to 25%. If your budget was a million dollars every year, you should have 100 to 250,000 sitting in fund balance in case something goes wrong. But this is a very tough issue because the taxpayers don't want you to have money in the bank. They rather have you use that than get taxes from them. So you have different interests. If you are a creditor, if you're S&P, you want the government to have more fund balance because that just in case if something happens, the creditors will get paid. See the different interests each party has? The taxpayer has a different interest from the creditor. So each one is looking out for their own interests. So there is really no right answer here, but this is an example of what I just spoke about. Encumbrance accounting, I think I spoke to you about. This goes into more in depth. You need to create a commitment. And here's an example. Ordered supplies for 420. What's the first entry? Debit encumbrance. Credit encumbrance outstanding. Notice the use of the year, 2014. That means could you have a different year? Yes, as we'll see. You know what that subsidiary ledger says basically? 420 is represented by these functions. 80,000 for general government, public safety, and this. So they've just divided that into those three categories. That's what they ordered the supplies for. Obviously, the final bill doesn't come to be 420. It comes at 433. Again, you have this being reversed, these, just like what you saw before. This was the original entry, and now this is being reversed. And you know, some people say, maybe we should make it two separate entries, one to reverse it and one to book the expenditure. And that's fine. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. If it makes it clearer, you know, have one to reverse the original entry and then the other one. 
this is another word for accounts payable. They use this word because that's what governments use to pay their bills. So it's the same thing, thing as accounts payable. Everybody got that entry? Everyone go into, look at the same entry. Compare this entry, expenditures, right? And payable entry, and compare that to this. Instead of expenditures, what do we have? Expenses. So now we are using dual track. This was done under the modified accrual basis. Got it? Same transaction now being recorded under accrual basis. Instead of expenditures, what do we have? Expenses. And instead of just having one line expense, they actually divided it, so it makes it easier to allocate it to the function. And again, notice encumbrance has no effect at the government-wide level. We don't recognize that because it's a budgetary account. Payroll. This is pretty straightforward, and I'm not going to go into this because it's very much like what you had for for-profit. You debit expenditures credit cash, <coughs> taxes, whatever you have. The important thing to remember here is this last piece, encumbrance. Remember I told you for everything you purchase in government, you should encumber first, not for payroll. Because it's not really discretionary spending. You have payroll which comes up every two weeks and you pay. So no encumbrance entry for payroll. Here's a general entry. All right, tell me, what, what does this do to federal government all about? What does this do to state government all about? Anyone care to guess? What is it? Payroll tax. Federal government is your federal withholding and FICA. And what state? Your New Jersey state tax holding, right? That's the amount that's due to them. This is a very standard journal entry. So what this is is you get a paycheck for $1,000. It says gross pay. You only get 800 Employers kept what? $200 to pay your taxes. This recognizes it. $1,000 there, you only get paid 800 and 200 is divided between federal and state, which they will pay later. And this is the entry, the same entry, instead of on a modified accrual basis, at the governmental activities level, now we have expenses. Any difference between the entries? None. Okay. And here is the FICA is being recorded. Again, you can go through this. Uh, there's a series of entries. Okay. And everybody knows that when you get Social Security cut from your paycheck, it has to be matched by the employer, right? So what is it, seven point some percent that gets cut from your payroll for Medicare, I mean for Social Security, the employer has to match that. And that's the employer's portion. So your paycheck has federal withholding, right, which you pay for, employer doesn't pay anything. Social Security, which you and employer pay, state withholding, which you pay, disability insurance, SDI, F family, there's a family FLA. So when you look at all your lists, those are all the deductions, but this is the one that is paid by your employer in addition to your paying it. So next time when you look at the paycheck, look at all the deductions. 
And you always wonder, geez, I got paid $1,000, but I, this is my paycheck for 800. I wonder if my employer is going to pay that 200 that they withheld. They do as it shows up. And again, the same entry, instead of it's shown by function. Now the most important area, which is accounting for property taxes. Oops, sorry. I didn't mean to go through that quickly, but it is relatively straightforward. And you should just take a um, look at that uh, in the text itself. This is what we talked about, the tax levy, also called the ghost tax levy. So again, if my collection rate, my bad uh, uncollectible rate was 4%, and I needed to raise 960000 what would be my gross tax levy? 960 divided by 0.96, which then gives me a million dollars that I need to raise. And that's an example. In fact, I think there is, let's see, an example in the, let's just take a look at this. Take a look at this question, 4-5. Somebody's got a calculator. So what is the total amount of the gross tax levy? And tell me how you calculated it. Any volunteers? Somebody's got a calculator. You've got a calculator. OK. All right, let's try this again. 6,720, right? That's the number, right? And 4% is not collectible. So what is collectible? 0.96, right? Not multiply, it's 6 you have to divide that by number. Do that again, 6,720, and divide that by 0.96. No, what I'm trying to figure out is how much should I collect to have me receive 6,720. So somebody said 7 million, who was that? Okay, so just explain to me in words what that means. So what happens to the rest? That's right. That's uncollectible. That's 4%. Good. Good. Everybody got that? So you have to collect 7 to get what? 6,720. Everybody got that? Anybody not get that? Okay. That's how we calculate. The, yeah. No, no. It's, call, it's just like bad debt provision. 4% will not be collectible. That's the estimate. We're not saying that would be the final number, but we're saying that's the estimate. So we have to be conservative and assume that it won't be collected. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, actually, we will take a look at. And you know, it's a very interesting question because what happens with property taxes? If you don't pay your property taxes, what's going to happen? Yeah. Well, actually, what can happen is the government has the ultimate weapon, which is they can put a lien on your house and force you to sell your home to pay the taxes. And that's why people say, but it's never, it's always collectible. But that's not how we looked at it. Because we need to collect it for under modified accrual basis for the current period. We won't, don't want to be thinking three or four years or from now where we will be doing that. So yes, there will be uncollectible portions. Okay, so that was that. Um, 
There are lots of really interesting stories here. We don't have the time, but I, in New Jersey especially, um, maybe I'll tell you a few ones. <coughs> tax rate. You un need to understand what is meant by the tax rate. Fancy definition? No. If the house was worth five million and your tax rate was, let's make it more reasonable, 500,000, and your tax rate was 2%, what would it be? It would be 500,000 times 2%, right? So the question is, how do we come up with, do you, do you see that per 100 or per 1,000? So it's the nomenclature. That's how they describe it. They don't use the word percentage. They say $2.15 per hundred. So you need to understand that's 2.15. Or they'll say $25 per thousand. That means 2.5%, right? And let me just explain to you, let's put yourself back into the CFO's shoes. So you added up all the property in your town. All the property in your town is worth $100 million. That's the value, the assessed value of the property. Not the market value, but the assessed value. And I won't go into this because that's a whole course on assessment practices. But let's assume that the assessment is the tax bill which says what your property is worth, $100 million. You come up and your residual amount that you need to raise is a million dollars from those hundred million dollars worth of property. What's your tax rate? One million, one percent. Yep, it's one percent, right? You did it automatically, right? What did you do? You took the amount that you needed to raise, divide by your total assessment. So you need to raise two million dollars and you have a hundred million dollars worth of property. What's your tax rate? 2%. And that's the bill that you're going to send out. That's what the tax collect, the tax assessors do. Now, Newark has been, it's a very, and it, again, I, uh, maybe I'll just take a few minutes and describe to you the real world. In some towns, you could have a home which on the tax bill shows up as $250,000 but the home is worth half a million dollars. And you're smiling and saying, oh, this is great. Because if it was worth 500,000, I'd be paying twice as much taxes. But it's all relative. Because you know what? Everybody else in the town, assuming this is the case, has the same situation. Their houses are worth, on the tax records, half of what they are truly worth in the market. And that's what we call an assessment ratio. So what is the ratio for a house which is shows on the tax records as 250 when it's really worth half a million? 50%. And this is what was happening to Newark. It had assessment ratios far below 50%. And in New Jersey, there is a rule which says you must reassess your property every seven years. And Newark refused to do it. And they went to court, and finally they decided to do that. But again, I'm telling you this because maybe this will pique some of your interest if you're ever into tax policy or what. What happens is a town doesn't just contain residential. It contains residential and commercial properties. And people like lots of commercial properties in their town. Why? Because of rateables. Because what do they do? They produce taxes. And the more taxes they produce, the less taxes you'll have to pay, right? And office buildings don't send school kids. Homes do, not office buildings. So it costs them less to service that. But what happens is that people, owners of those buildings, always want to make sure that the town's assessment records truly reflect the value of the property. 
let me turn this around. Your, you get a tax bill based on a home that's worth 500,000. Market fell, it's worth only 250 now. Would you be happy? You know what you're going to do? Next day you're going to file a tax appeal and say, you know what? You guys got it wrong. My house is worth only 250. Here are the sale records I have. Reduce by my taxes by half. That's what commercial property owners do. And it causes a lot of havoc with towns, especially those who have commercial properties and um, residential properties. And it's usually the residential people who get shortchanged at the very end. Because if the appeal is won by a commercial property owner who are big time lawyers, somebody's gotta pay. Who is it? The residential. And that's what Newark was trying to avoid was to pass that burden off to the residential people. But now it's, you know, things have, it's, it's, it's very difficult for towns like Newark and others which have, you know, have uh, major commercial development but also have residential development which pays a lot of taxes. And when the commercial property owners appeal their taxes, guess who ends up paying? The residential. So again, I, uh, I didn't want to go too much into this, but maybe as you study this, you will see how this is uh, you know, real stuff that can affect people uh, in, um, in real ways, actually. Okay, this is the assessment ratio I was telling you about. Assessment value is the value of the taxable property times the assessment ratio. What would we like to see? An assessment ratio of one, 100% or one. Whatever the value of the property is on the town's book, that's the value of market value. That doesn't happen. It's very hard. Okay, here we go with our first journal entry on property tax. I want you to just study this for a moment. Very important to get the debits and credits right. There's 1% uncollectible, so 495,000 is going to be received. An estimated uncollectible current taxes of 5,000. It's the, like your provision for doubtful accounts. Everybody see this? Anybody have a pro problem understanding this journal entry? You need to un get these titles of these accounts right. Taxes receivable current estimated uncollectible current taxes. You have to get the titles right. Okay. This is at the start of the year. What happens next? This is done at the general fund level, and this is done, oops, I had this thing. Uh, this 5,000 should be really here, okay? This 5,000 should be really here, okay? Same journal entry, except Titles are a little different, general revenue property taxes, because that's the way it's shown in the statement of activities. Same journal entry. At the end of the year, we get 450,000. Everybody understand this? Debit cash and what? So what's our receivable balance now? No, what was it before? 495, what did we get? 450, so what is it now? 45, right? Notice, same journal entry for both government-wide and general fund. Oh. At the end of the year, the tax collector scratching his or her head and saying, uh-oh, I only thought 5,000 was going to be uncollectible. I got 50,000 now, now there, outstanding. Notice the term, just take a moment and read the accounts and see if they make any sense. You can't memorize this, you gotta understand this. Do you remember this from anywhere? This line? 
that was at the very beginning, right? Estimated uncollectible, we did that at the very start. Look at what they do. It becomes from current to delinquent because by the end of the year, you haven't received those taxes, so they become from current to delinquent. This balance, which was a receivable, now becomes what? Also delinquent. All we are doing here is just changing the title of the account. It would have been nice if we had just scratched the title and took current off and put delinquent, but we don't do that in accounting. What do we do? Create a journal entry to reclassify the amount from current to delinquent. So this journal entry, that's what it does. It makes things from current to delinquent. Okay? So it was current before, now it makes it delinquent. It was current before, now it makes it delinquent. This is a debit entry, by the way. Interest and penalties receivable. Now what happens is, now things get a little bit more difficult. End of the year, you haven't gotten the money. Not only do you have to pay those taxes that are due, you have to pay interest and penalty, just like the IRS for late payment. Interest and penalties, by the way, that should be debit. Receivable is $500, they calculated that. I know this goes, to, this is crazy. But look at the next line. Estimated uncollectible interest and penalty. So the interest and penalties that you are going to collect on stuff that wasn't paid, you expect some of that uncollectible. It's crazy, but think about it again. So they owe you money, and you're going to charge them interest and penalty, which is worth $500. But of that $500, some people aren't going to pay you. So now you have to set up another estimated uncollectible. It's like one on top of the other, and I know this is hard for students because they can't figure out if, you know, if something was uncollectible, now you're making a provision and then you're charging an interest and penalty, and then you're saying that interest and penalty part of it is also uncollectible. That's what's happening here. And same journal entry under governmental activities. This is what happens at the end. Uh, that question in the back, this is the amount being written off of delinquent taxes and interest and penalties. Again, these journal entries are shown in a lot of detail in the text itself. But what I want you to do is, this is what I want you to think about. I want you to understand how to record the initial tax levy, which we did journal entry number one. Understand how to record taxes that are received. Understand how to classify current taxes to delinquent taxes. Next, Understand how to make a provision for uncollectible taxes on those fines and penalties that you're not going to be receiving, and then the final write-off. So it's like a five-step process. You get the five-step process. Does it change? No, it's going to be the exact same one. You're never going to get a trick where, you know, a, a situation where the accounts would be reversed. It's the same exact journal entry. It's just that the amounts would be different. Okay, tax anticipation notes. Um, I won't go too much into the tax anticipation notes, but basically, um, you know, if you own a home, you get a tax bill. It's paid four times during the year. I think February 1, 
May 1, August 1, November 1. Those are the dates when you pay your tax bill. In equal installments, you start off the year, January 1. Hey, no money till February. What do we do? Go borrow money from the bank. Would the bank lend it to you? Yeah, they'll say, that's why we call it what? Tax anticipation notes. Because when taxes are received, that money is repaid. So this is done by CFOs to basically bridge short-term cash flow needs. And banks are very willing to do that, okay? Through a li line of credit or tax anticipation notes. Here's one. They sign a 60-day note discounted at 6%. Notice something unusual in this entry. We're used to seeing interest being charged. If it were 6%, right, and it's 60 days, right, you would think that it would be, so it's 1% for that period. It'd be 1% of 300,000. But no, it's a discounted note. Like when you take a class in finance, for instance, treasury bills are discounted as opposed to treasury notes, where you earn interest on face value of the note. With this, what you have is the note is for 300,000. How much cash are you getting? Only 297, not 300, because the rest of it is used to pay off the interest. So that's very unusual. And that's why I want you to make sure that you understand this, that even though you borrowed 300, you only got 297 because $3,000 is paid as interest. Not that you got 300,000 and then you paid 3,000 because it's discounted. Okay. Now on some other topics, revision of the budget during the year, why do governments do that? Why do they do that, by the way? Why do we sh should they revise their budget? Well, they do it for various reasons. If you ever become an auditor and auditing a governmental entity and they revise the budget, don't think there's anything too wrong. It could be for a valid reason. It could be that you did not estimate revenues correctly, something happened, some, you know, some unforeseen event. So it could be for various reasons. And it's important for them to revise their budget to reflect that. So let me give you an example. You expect to receive $40,000 more and expect to spend $30,000 more, what should your journal entry be? Debit, estimated revenue, because you're going to receive. Credit, appropriation, which is what? 30,000, and the difference goes to the fund balance. And that's all it is. If your revenues were overstated and they were going to be $20,000 less, what would you do? Well, you're not going to debit estimated revenues because that's to increase it you'd now credit estimated revenues because they're going to be decreased. So that's how you work with this, is um, just make sure you don't have a drink while doing this journal entry. Okay. Might cause a few problems, okay. Uh, so here's the, uh, what I was just telling you, how the budget provisions are recorded and it's normal to have that happen. Encumbrance of a prior period, I wouldn't be concerned too much about this. Um, this is what happens. December 27th, you order a piece of, you know, you order some supplies. 
everything's closed. You send out the purchase order, debit encumbrance for 1,000, credit encumbrance outstanding. Years finished down December 31st. What happened? 2014, next year's 2015, what do you do now? There's an encumbrance which says, encumbrance, debit $1,000, and credit encumbrance outstanding 1,000, 2014. Well, this is what happens with government. Some governments say, once the fiscal year is over, close all budgetary accounts. It does not matter. So literally, what you have to do is close the account at the end of the year, and on January 1, redo it. Okay? So you have that. Some governments say, let's, let's not get too excited about this. What we're going to do is leave it open. It's okay. Leave it open. We'll deal with it next year. That's what I'm going to show you. Okay. And this is what this is. Appropriations lapsing, meaning what? The authority expires, so you have to cancel it. Okay. By the way, with state of New Jersey, with certain items, that's what happens. It lapses. You do not have the authority to continue. And the second one is what I just mentioned to you. Here's, a one, here's an example. Take a look at this. So this was the journal entry from last year, which is being reversed. They show the expenditure not for this year. Remember, this is happening in 2014, January of 2014. They show this expenditure for 2013 and the difference for 2014. Anybody not understand this? Don't make it more complicated than it is. Encumbrance outstanding, reverse the entry. This is your expenditure for 2013. What they're basically saying is any additional cost has to be recognized for the new year, not for the past year, but for new year, because that's all that you made the commitment for, for last year. And the account is closed, so you can't go back and say, uh, you know, that's the number for 2014. Some of you might not agree with that, but this is an exact opposite example. Instead of it being more, it's less. Instead of 8,500, now it's 8,100. You do the same thing, reverse the encumbrance, expenditure. The beauty about this is, if you see any beauty, it's, it's the same accounts and the same journal entry every single time. If you understand the journal entry that you need to make when you order an item, it's going to be the same every single time. If you recognize the journal entry that needs to be made when you receive an item, it's the same every time. Now, accounting for inventories is also, well, it's a small area too here. Um, governments don't carry a lot of inventory. They really don't. It's not like a commercial entity which carries inventory. Inventories are not a big deal. But some governments might have. There's an easy way and there's a more difficult way. If you don't carry a lot of inventory, pick the easy way. And the easy way is the purchase method. If you've got a lot of inventory, the auditors might say, that's no good, you've got to use the second one. So what's the difference? This is the difference. So you have inventories of supplies. You have some money, you know, some inventory sitting. You go buy $1,000 worth of inventory. What do we do in commercial enterprises? When you buy inventory, what's the account that we debit and credit? We credit cash or whatever and debit what? Inventory, right? Under the purchase method, it says don't debit inventory. Debit expenditure, like as if it was you spent it already. And in the second method, no rocket science there either. 
The second one says, if it's substantial, debit and interest. The first one says expensive. We don't need, like to use the word expense. We need to say it's what? Reported as total expenditure. Now, I made this sound to you very simple. There's one little complication, okay, which is this. So at the end of the year, you send somebody out, takes account, and says you've got $900 worth of inventory at the end of the year. Many, many slides ago, I don't know if you remember, there was a slide on fund balance which said spendable and non-spendable fund balance. I don't know if you remember that. It's like your account, your reserve, some of it could be spent and some of it couldn't. And what happens in governmental accounting is whatever the amount of inventory you show on the asset side has to be offset by an equal amount of non-spendable fund balance. So if you have $900 worth of inventory sitting in your asset, you don't have a liability. You've got to figure somehow to balance that. You have $900 worth of non-spendable fund balance. That's the complication there. Okay. So everybody understand the purchase. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. We want to make things easy in life, not complicated. So I sometimes, in order to make it simple, what, I'm tr what I try to do is not get into the areas which can cause confusion. Okay? For instance, the area where you will find an entry at the end where they actually adjust the fund balance at the end of the year. Sure, they would have to. If your inventory last year was 900 and this year it's 800, what do you have to do to your fund balance? You have to bring it down to 800. That's the complication, okay? And one uses periodic, the other uses perpetual system. <coughs> Here's the purchase method. Look at what they do. They buy the stuff and they don't debit inventory, expenditures. But at this was the little complication I was telling you about, adjusting it at the end of the year to make sure that both the inventory account and the fund balance account agree. Look at what happens at the governmental activities. It's never, ever expensed. Always inventory of supplies because we're using accrual basis of accounting. This is what all of us will understand. And again, expense, no different than what you would find in a business enterprise. By the way, I, I got to tell you a quick story about this. This one subject, along with some others, is causing some real issues for the financial reporting model under GASB. And not that any one of you might be interested in this, but flow of financial resources. What does that mean? Cash or mere cash, right? Inventories. Are they cash? Are they mere cash? Can you just go and sell and get what you? But they show up in governmental fund balance sheet, and it causes a real problem to people because it's contrary to what I've just told you about. And because of that, GASB is looking at how to deal with this and other issues where we keep on telling flow of financial resources and look at the balance sheet and just say, gosh, this is not financial resources. So they are coming, for those of you who are interested, uh, GASB is looking at something called near-term model. So instead of financial resources, this is so, you know, that's on the works right now. It's called near-term financial reporting model. But it's, as I said, this one issue has caused a lot, you know, a lot of problems for the governmental accounting. Not a lot of problems in that sense, but, you know, things that they need to think about. Okay. Um, let's do one thing, which is... Um, to uh, 
talk about a uh, couple of more items and then we'll finish. Uh, special revenue funds. And uh, so we looked at general fund. What, what are special revenue funds again? They are where the revenue is what? Restricted. Is restricted or so something for, it's specified for a specific purpose, right? Special revenue funds, you know those statements we saw for the general fund? Special revenue funds have the same statements. Budgets that are required for general fund, special revenue funds also have budgets. So they are like, they very much look and operate like general fund, except they are for a specific purpose. So here's an example. These are some examples, motor fuel tax, federal grants, specific purpose. This is what I was telling about the grants. Take a look at this. Actually, this is part of your question. Yeah, this is, I think, one of the homework questions I gave you. So this is what I was speaking about. You basically report it as deferred revenue, as a liability. And the new term by GASB, the next edition of the book that comes out, there is a new element which is called deferred inflow. It's reflected, that's where this would be reflected. You know, when you think about government accounting, GASB only came into being in 84, 1984. And it's still evolving. I mean, where else would you find new financial elements being added to financial statements? So, and we are doing that right now as we go through this. This is the general entry I was talking about. Debit, cash, and credit, deferred revenue. And next year, what would you do when you recognize it? Debit, referred, deferred revenue, and credit, revenue. Yep, got it? Debit, deferred revenue, and credit, revenue. Right? That would be next year when it's available or has been earned. And there's the example. They spent $75,000 but they also need to recognize a revenue. Do you see that? Two entries being made. One to recognize the expenditure and the other to recognize the revenue. Because deferred revenue shows up on the balance sheet. The statements are pretty much the same. You have the balance sheet, statement of revenues, expenditures and changes in fund balance, and then if the fund meets the definition of a major fund. If not, show it as other governmental funds. I think one of the CAFR exercises requires you to identify special revenue funds. So if it's a major fund, it will show up on the governmental fund balance sheet and the statement of revenue expenditures. It will show up See this? This could be a special revenue fund. This could be a special revenue fund. Could be any major fund. And if it's not a major fund, where would it go? Here. Got it? General fund always shows up by itself. All the other governmental funds that I talked to you, if it's major, shows up here. Now, there is a little thing to this, which is a government can designate a fund as major even if it doesn't meet the definition, if they think it's important enough. They can designate it, that it's a major fund, even if it doesn't meet the definition. But on the reverse side, if a fund meets the major fund 
definition, you can't make it non-major. So if it meets the test, you don't have the option of saying, no, it's not a major form. But if it doesn't meet the test, you have the option to say it. So that's the difference. Okay. All right. Um, Now let me, uh, our last topic is really about exchange and non-exchange transactions. And the best way to understand this is the easiest way to understand it. Whenever you have an exchange transaction occurring in governments, what does the word exchange mean? Exchanging value for value. So if you provided a monetary value, you will get a resource back equal to the monetary value. That's an exchange transaction. A non-exchange is what? Where that does not happen. And why do we make a big deal out of this? Because depending on how these items are classified determines how we recognize them in the government's book, how we book them, okay? An internal exchange transaction, for instance, a government operates a water utility. The city hall has to get water from somewhere, so it buys it from its own utility. Utility supplies the water and sends a bill to city hall. The city hall doesn't say, hey, you are a utility of the government, I'm not gonna pay you. No, they recognize that as an expenditure and the utility recognize that as a revenue. And this is an internal exchange transaction between one arm of the government with another, okay? And this is what you see here. Not an interfund transfer in and out. What's an interfund transfer? You say, what does that mean? Well, sometimes for instance, you have debt outstanding and you need to pay the debt off to the debt service fund. Where is the debt service fund going to get the money from? The general fund. How does the general fund do it? By doing an inter-fund transfer out to the debt service fund. Any exchange of value? No, they've just basically done what? Transferred cash over. So that's the distinction between an exchange transaction and just an interfund transfer in and out. And there are, you can read about this, there are loans that are made from one part of the government to another. There are reciprocal, non-reciprocal, I won't go into this, but uh, these are the types of interfund activity that can occur between two different funds. The magic rule that you should always remember is that any transaction that occurs within the five governmental funds, general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital projects fund, permanent fund, any transaction that occurs within the five on the government operating statements, you have to eliminate those transactions. You don't want to be double counting you don't want to be double counting transactions. It's like transactions occurring within the same family. However, if the transaction occurs between the governmental and the business type or fiduciary, they are recognized. But within the, you still book, book it, but you don't show, you don't want to be blowing up your balance sheet just because of internal transactions between governmental funds. So that's the reason. And we'll look at that more. Inter, you can read about this more, but let's just talk a little bit about permanent fund. I see one of you picked Alaska as your CAFR exercise, and I'm glad you found the Alaska Permanent Fund. Again, intended for a public purpose. That's the word, public purpose. Not private purpose, public purpose. 
public purpose meaning benefits everyone, not a group, but everyone. Second, only the principal amount, only the earnings can be spent. Principal amount has to be kept intact. And we'll look at variations as we go through the course. These are the exchange transaction, and unfortunately, you would have to really read this and kind of understand and retain this because um, we'll take a look at the different types of transactions that occur both in exchange and non-exchange. I told you about exchange. Exchange-like transactions are those. Exchange transaction, pure exchange transaction, and exchange-like transactions. Not equal value. Pure exchange is equal value. Exchange-like is not equal value. Some value, but not equal. These are non-exchange transactions, and I think I talked to you about this is where specifically you have a grant revenue recognition depends. I remember I talked to you, the time has to be, uh, has to be present, the eligibility requirements, okay? Purpose restriction, you remember this from my grants. Non-exchange, when the state when the town gets a grant from the federal government, does the town give anything back to the federal government? No, they just spend it, right? When money is received for Hurricane Sandy it, by New Jersey towns, are they giving anything back? No, they're just fixing things. That falls right there. And that's why we need to know how to recognize this, those types of transactions. I talked to you about it. <coughs> okay, we're almost done. These are the non-exchange transactions. And I want you to remember these four types, classes of non-exchange transactions. Derived tax revenues. Why derived? Because it's derived from the value of your income or of the sale, derived tax revenue. Non-exchange, you paying sales tax, you're not getting anything back. Price of the item, yes, but when you pay the sales tax, somebody can say yes, the state's providing services, but not in that sense. Imposed non-exchange transactions. Why the word imposed? Because you don't have a choice. You have to pay it. Real estate taxes imposed on you. Government mandated non-exchange transactions. Like it or not, you're gonna get this grant. I'm very happy. Voluntary non-exchange transactions. You can have this grant if you want it. Some people say, boy, if somebody's giving us money, why don't we just take it? Why would we not want it? Sometimes matching requirements. I'll give you 100,000, you gotta put 100,000 of your own. That's the voluntary non-exchange transaction. And this is what I was getting to, which is you need to understand the revenue recognition criteria as to when to book this. And it tells you in this so slide, basically for a lot of words, drive tax revenue when the sale occurs or the period 